This lecture is about deductive reasoning. Uh, in this first lecture, I want to talk a little bit about what deduction is, uh, what logic is, uh, and how deductive logic differs from other kinds of reasoning and thinking. Let's start by defining reasoning and logic. So reasoning, which is something we've been talking about for a while now, uh, is could be described as going beyond the given information in order to comprehend a situation. Uh, so there's an emphasis here on being able to go beyond what is present. So going, being able to go beyond what you can see uh, and experience directly. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to do this. Uh, one is by making inferences, uh, which we've talked about. Uh, and today we're going to talk about making deduction. We're going to talk about taking knowledge about what's known and drawing very specific kinds of conclusions. And one of the things that's interesting about deductive logic is that we can often discover something new just by thinking about it. So we've talked about induction already. This is uh, reasoning based on categories. We've touched briefly on the idea of inferring cause uh, in our induction lecture. So today I want to talk about uh, deduction, or reasoning about specific cases. Let's look at a straightforward example first, uh, and then we'll unpack the example uh, to talk about the parts uh, and pieces of deduction. So suppose you buy coffee from McDonald's. Uh, McDonald's uh, so, you know, tries to push their coffee, call it McCafe or something like that, uh, and um, I kind of like McDonald's coffee. I think it's uh, as good as any other. I guess it's as good as Tim Hortons, uh, as good as Starbucks. It's a pretty good place to get coffee, okay? Um, so you buy your coffee from McDonald's. You walk in and buy it. You go through the drive through and you take a sip. That's step two. Uh, step three, you discover upon sipping this coffee that it's very hot. Uh, and then you conclude uh, from your experience that McDonald's coffee is very hot. Now, this is a generalization. This is a form of inductive reasoning. And suppose you've done this a few times. Let's suppose on the way to work, stop at McDonald's coffee, take a sip, you discover that it's hot each time, and so you can eventually generalize, make this conclusion, McDonald's coffee is hot. That's that bottom-up kind of reasoning we talked about last week uh, when we talked about inductive logic. However, from this generalization, you can also form a general premise about McDonald's coffee, and you can state this premise formally as premise. McDonald's coffee is very hot. This is a fact that you can now test. You can make conclusions about specific cases based on this general premise, and that's what deductive logic is about. Once you have a premise, you can use the premise to make precise conclusions, and we call these deductions. Uh, combined with additional premises, uh, additional information, uh, and a conclusion, you can create what's called a syllogism. This is a formal statement of facts and a conclusion from those facts. And what we want to know in deduction is whether or not the conclusions are valid. Uh, if the arguments are structured in the right way, uh, if it's a valid deduction, then we know that the conclusion uh, is, you know, we, we can trust the conclusion uh, to be valid. We can trust that it's the only possible conclusion that can be drawn from the premises. That's the key distinction uh, here with deduction. A valid conclusion or a valid uh, syllogism is one in which the conclusion is the only possible one you can draw. There's no other ambiguity. So let's look at an, an example of a categorical syllogism uh, with the McDonald's coffee. So you've got this premise you've formed. All McDonald's coffee is very hot. Uh, then you have a single case. You buy a cup of coffee from McDonald's. Uh, you bought it from McDonald's. It has the McDonald's logo on the cup. Uh, so it's a, it's a McDonald's coffee. You can conclude logically that this coffee is also very hot. And you do this because you start with a premise that all McDonald's coffee is hot. You have a specific case. This is a McDonald's coffee. If all coffee is hot from McDonald's, and this is a McDonald's coffee, therefore it has no choice but to be very hot. Uh, it's the only possible conclusion you can draw. And when I say to discover something new about thinking about it, uh, this is a very simple but straightforward example of what that would be. Uh, you don't have to drink the coffee to know that it's hot. You've already deduced that it's going to be hot, and you've concluded that it's going to be hot based on the way in which you've set up the premises. That's what deduction is, and this is a very simple example. 
The problem that most people have with deduction is that it can seem really counterintuitive. As we'll see in a little bit in this lecture, and also in the next two lectures, uh, there's lots of cases where uh, deduction seems to run counter to how we want to think about things. It runs counter to uh, sort of the natural laws of cause and effect, and it seems to run counter uh, to the kinds of explanations and beliefs that we have. Uh, deduction can be very cognitively demanding because you have to keep several premises straight. Let's look at an example, and I discuss this example in the textbook also. So this is a, this is a very old example from the 1960s, uh, and uh, Mary Henley is a, uh, was a psychologist who studied reasoning and thinking, uh, one of the early pioneers in this area. Uh, and she tested her uh, subjects uh, in their ability to draw uh, conclusions and determine whether or not conclusions are valid. In other words, when I say a valid conclusion, I mean, uh, is it the only possible conclusion that can be drawn given the premises? If other conclusions can also be, be drawn given the premises, then it's not valid. It doesn't mean the conclusion is wrong. It just means that the uh, conclusion is only one of several possible conclusions that can be drawn given the information. So here's the example she gives, uh, and this does sound a little bit dated, of course, uh, because it's from 1962. A group of women were discussing their household problems. See, it already sounds kind of dated. Mrs. Shivers broke the ice by saying, I'm so glad we're talking about these problems. It's so important to talk about things that are in our minds. We spend so much of our time in the kitchen that, of course, household problems are in our minds. So it's important to talk about them. And then she asked her subjects, does it follow? And when she says, does it follow, she means, is it logically valid? So these subjects were asked to determine specifically, is this a logically valid deduction? Does it follow that's it that it is important to talk about them? In other words, when Mrs. Shivers concludes, it's important to talk about our household problems. Is that a valid deduction, given the other statements that she makes? So before you go on, uh, maybe pause the video, think about whether or not this is a valid deduction. Given the statements, I'm glad we're talking about them. It's important to talk about things that are in our minds. We spend so much time in the kitchen that, of course, household problems are in our minds, so it's important to talk about them. Valid or not valid? So what she found, of course, was that many of her subjects, in fact, most of her subjects, had difficulty interpreting these. They were had difficulty telling whether or not it was valid. Uh, for one thing, it's not framed like a classical syllogism. Uh, it, there's no premise marked off, and there's no conclusion marked off. So you've got to figure out what those are. Uh, and then it seems to activate all sorts of other ideas and schemas and concepts. So here's an example of what some of her subjects said. Uh, one said, no, it's not important to talk about things that are in our minds unless they worry us, which is not the case. So that subject is saying, no, this is not a valid deduction. That's an incorrect uh, conclusion. It is a valid deduction. Uh, so this subject was wrong uh, because they added some information. They added information about whether or not the things worry us. Mrs. Shivers doesn't say anything about uh, whether or not these things worry us. She just says they're in our mind. Uh, here's another subject who is correct to say, yes, it's a valid deduction, but also activates additional information, uh, which suggests that this subject also is not uh, reasoning logically. Yes, it could be very important for the individual doing the talking and possibly to some of those listening, because it's important for people to get a load off their chest, but not for any other reason, unless the process is one or the other learns something new and of value. That's a lot of not. It's not a lot of nonsense, but it's a lot of information that is not important uh, to determining the validity of this syllogism. So, yeah, it's correct that they said yes, but they've got all the wrong reasons in there. All of this information is something that the individual subject believes but isn't present in the syllogism. So how would we describe whether or not this is a valid or a non-valid conclusion? Henley calls this the failure to accept the logical task. And her point was that uh, although people can reason logically, uh, the subjects in her study uh, had taken courses in deductive logic. So they knew how to reason logically. 
Uh, it's just that they didn't. Uh, and even when they were asked to do it with a more complicated story around it, it became very difficult for people to uh, determine what the premises were uh, and to look at those premises in isolation from the other context. In other words, people just kept activating context. And that's something that, I mean, based on what we've talked about in our class so far, uh, the way memory works and the way concepts work and the way language works, it's really difficult to uh, think about only one thing without activation spreading to other things. As soon as you hear about people talking about household problems, well, you're listening to the premise, but you probably also start thinking about household problems. Maybe you think about things that need to be done in your house, or maybe you think about uh, problems that are in your mind, and then maybe you start thinking about whether or not it's important to talk about things, and what does it mean for it to be important to talk about things. And all of these things probably are going on while you're hearing these premises, and the way you're memory works and the way your mind works and the way concepts work, that spreading activation happens. And so what Henley found is that it's really difficult to focus on just the deductive task. What happens is we fail to accept the logical task and we reason uh, by thinking about our beliefs and our knowledge rather than by reasoning just by logic alone. So how would we solve this problem just by logic alone? Let's look at it uh, briefly. So here's the statement again. A group of women were discussing their household problems. Mrs. Shivers broke the ice by saying, I'm so glad we're talking about these problems. And then this one highlighted is the first uh, real premise. It's so important to talk about things that are in our minds. If we wanted to restate that in a way that kind of got rid of some of the schema and context and semantic content, we could just say it's important to do A. Uh, so that's premise A. Premise one, it is important to do A. Uh, we spend so much time in the kitchen that, of course, household problems are in our minds. That's premise two. can be restated formally as B is equal to A. So B is a case of A. Uh, the conclusion, it is therefore important to do B. If it's important to do A, and A and B are equivalent, then it's also important to do B. So this is a valid deduction. Uh, that's the conclusion that can be drawn given the premises. And there's no alternative conclusion that can be drawn given those premises. But you can see that this is not how most of us think about things. What most of us do is we activate our concepts and we uh, activate our semantic memories and we activate schema and we think about our beliefs and our understandings. Uh, so in most of the other lectures, or the two other lectures we're going to talk about this, um, that's going to be the main issue is the contrast or the conflict between what you believe and understand and what you can determine just through logic. So in the next two lectures, we're going to have one lecture on categorical reasoning, uh, and that's reasoning about whole classes and categories of things. We just saw an example uh, in, in this lecture with the McDonald's coffee uh, and also uh, the household problems coffee. Those are categorical. All McDonald's coffee is hot. That's a statement about a category. Uh, so we'll talk about categorical reasoning first and what valid deductions look like and what non-valid deductions look like. Then I'll have another lecture on conditional reasoning, which are sort of if-then statements. But those are in the next lecture.